Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm Jenna. And I'm Jenna. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week we're talking about Season 1, Episode 22. Again, because the pilot was two episodes for us. The penultimate episode, second to last, titled Evan. A fantastic episode that premiered on May 3rd, 1985. The director was Rob Cohen, who is our triple x director the main hollywood big time hollywood director he previously did made for each other and he's got another episode coming up called De- definitely miami it was written by paul diamond who also wrote phil the shill which has our buddy phil collins in that episode <laughs> before we get started i'd like to check in and see what's going on in each other's lives this is my favorite time of year guys because i de- i have dealt with four months of listening to everyone talk about weather in phoenix and how ridiculous it is out here and how no one could ever live out here can i tell you guys it's been like in the eight, mid 80s light breeze cool in the evenings it's just the we're almost there to just this perfect weather out here in the valley hey john what's the weather like up in seattle oh you know it, it's a typhoon up here I think is the correct terminology. <laughs> the we had a series of storms roll through the last couple of days, and our average winds were forty to fifty mile per hour with a, a sixty mile an hour gusts. W- what is hilarious is that I follow the uh, traffic cams the uh, for Thurston County, and on their Twitter account. They posted video of people being blown backwards while trying to walk across the street. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, that's Seattle, though. You know, Seattle has some bad weather. Hey, Jenna, what's the what? How has the weather been in the Bay Area? It's raining. It's wet. I'm wet. Everything is wet. And we're not prepared for this, okay? Because I was in shorts last weekend. So we're at that nice time of year where the majority of the time is heater on in the morning, air conditioning on in the afternoon. You know, you work in San Francisco, so I mean, the weather I've officially never... started practically having to bring a suitcase with me to work so that I can, <laughs> I can clothe and declothe as necessary to, <laughs> to accommodate the weather. Well, I just, you know, I wanted to take this opportunity to really highlight that times are changing, bitches. Phoenix is good. You know what? You get <laughs> off your soapbox and go. You can enjoy your Florida of the West, my friend. <laughs> you know, I will say this, though. No matter how bad the weather gets up here, us At Washingtonians, least it's not Arizona. <laughs> our, our, us Washingtonians, we just have a way of just tur- tuning it out because there were people outside mowing the lawn and it is that. <laughs> That almost seems like it's Stockholm Syndrome. That's that's kind of what that seems like. I mean, what are they going to do? If they don't go outside, they're just never going to go outside. So, <laughs> Well, let's uh, let's dig into this episode. Because like I mentioned, this was a fantastic episode. So good. Beginning to end. So let's get over there and let's, let's break down this episode. All right. So even the opening, we have shorter, not necessarily one of the longer openings, but still a solid opening. We get a lot of information right out of the gate too yeah i mean it's a recap from a trump rally right like someone's just superimposed that clearly oh i'm sorry is my west coast showing they've got all the dummies all like chained up and stuff and i'm thinking like what is this some kind of kinky sex party yeah Yeah, i didn't know where it was going they're female mannequins that are chained up by the neck by the way in a random in just some random warehouse yeah it's a it's it's a huge warehouse and in comes the limo and it's got Evan, who ends up being one of the main characters throughout this whole episode, and Guzman, who he works for. Guzman is a is a gun runner. He's an arms dealer. He's de- de- we find out later that he's dealt arms all over Central America. And um, they get and out. I just want to point out: this is back when they made limos, right? Like I am pretty sure this, you know, the limos they made in the eighties, they were like bulletproof. They could drive through cop cars. <laughs> <laughs> it was just so reliable. <laughs> they just don't build them like they used to because Evan gets out and he, speaking of the dummies, he gets out and goes and talks to one of them and kisses it on the stomach. And then another car pulls in. And meanwhile, Tubbs and Crockett are watching from a really far away, actually. It's way further away than I thought. They're watching from a rooftop and they're radioing down two other vice and another car is pulled in. And this car, two guys get out. One guy, super orange, bad spray tan guy gets out. And they're both there to buy arms off of Guzman. I'm the ironic, thoughtful emoji right now. (laughs) So Mr. Matthews is out to to sell some guns, 
right? So they're going to deal to these two guys, and then the the vice team calls in because they're they're going to make a sting on this. And so they come pulling up. They get ready outside. The B team is leading the charge into the building. Inside, Evan gives he's talking about these Mac Ten guns that they're going to sell, and he's like he's going to give them a demo. And that's why the dummies are there. He's going to shoot the dummies or the mannequins with the with the Mac Tens, and he gets one in each hand and he just thoroughly enjoys himself while he shoots up these two dummies felt very um what's the miami coke drug runner movie scarface thank you scarface he has a fantastic time so they the deal pretty much done and then the vice team comes running in and for some reason only zito and swite go running in there's a bunch of other vice and Miami police outside, but only Zito and Swipe Tech go, go r- running in. And of course, it's a shootout. Yeah, it just seems ca- kind of very half ass bust that the Vice team is attempting here. You know, especially when they just watched Evan obliterate those dummies with Mac 10s. And Sonny radios in and says, It sounds like Mac 10s. He even recognizes the sound of the gun. So they tell him to be careful when they go in. Zito and Swipe Tech yes. go in, and immediately there's a shootout. They take down one yes. of the guys who are buying but then evan guzman and guzman's bodyguard jump into their limo but evan is driving this time instead of the bodyguard and again evan is having a fantastic time driving around in that limo and he- as i touched on earlier that limo uh, impervious to bullets speeds <laughs> away goes directly through the cop car making the cop car explode <laughs> it exploded like it was made out of TNT. I don't know how you make I'm a car you, they explode don't like make, that. Because it was hit by a 1980s limousine. It was almost like they it. stuffed a bunch of Galaxy Note 7s into the hood of that car so that when they hit it, it would just go up in flames. <laughs> uh, no one gets my technology joke. I'm sad now. <laughs> 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 and so then Evan and Guzman and them, they just drive away and they escape and we go to the opening credits. It was a very fast paced but odd odd opening yeah when we come back from the credits we're at the cleanup scene castillo comes pulling up he goes to talk to the duo and the b team the ladies are there too so like the entire vice team is there and we find out that they had found out from a small time snitch that there was a deal a small a deal going down but nothing that they expected like this the guns had armor piercing bullets the they were selling the mac 10s there was you know the 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 quality of gear that was there they were not prepared for and they're cleaning up the aftermath castillo then just is like hey just follow up on all the leads and we jump over to the precinct like i said since the beginning the entire vice team has been working on this so i have a bit of a confession to make in my recap in the last episode I did a little like how are Stan and Larry and I so, sort of watched Evan um, <laughs> like halfway through before realizing that I wasn't watching the right episode before. <laughs> wa- <laughs> so I had, you know, confused some details between the two before recording and uh, the ep- scene that I referenced in it where like they, they're short with one another looking through files is this exact. So uh, rewatching it this week, I, I realized that. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so I'm just going to I'm just going to put it out there that there's still trouble in paradise. I mean, we're hopeful. We're pulling for the couple. But yeah. You know. uh, yeah. You know, <laughs> Zito, he's a loud cheer. He's looking over Switek's shoulder. Switek is like, hey, can you go just go look at these files over at your desk? Like not just you look know. at everything I'm doing. He just wants some intimacy. They're never close anymore. <laughs> so and- I think we missed a little bit on the end of the last scene. It would seem that Sonny already knows something about there being a cop. I don't think he ever says that he knows it's a cop, but you definitely feel from the from the beginning that Sonny knows something is up, right? He knows some information he's not telling anyone else. Yes. We know as viewers, we see Evan he, Evan Freed and he's played by uh William Russ. By yeah, yeah, William Russ. So if if you've been paying attention for the last twenty years, you've probably seen him in some in some other T V stuff. Yeah. So if you are around the same age as me you might you would remember him most from being the dad from the uh, tgif joe boy meets world mr matthews the only thing i remember from that show is topanga so (laughs) i (laughs) that's about as the the end of my of my memory of that show (laughs) that show like was my childhood (laughs) 
And for you younger generation, he has reprised the role of, of Mr. Matthew in Girl Meets World. Yep. Mm. Um, Kids, ask your parents. But he also played a dirty cop in The Sopranos for a number of seasons. But the two things that really caught my attention are, one, the movie he made his debut in, which is one of the top five worst movies ever made, is 1977's Deathbed. The Bed That Eats You, which is about a possessed bed that, yes, indeed eats people who sleep in it. I wish, I so uh, wish I can get my hands on this movie. It has to be out there somewhere, and we will find it. <laughs> so, the other title that got my attention was 1001 Ways to Enjoy the Missionary Position, <laughs> which is not something that I like to imagine Mr. Matthews from my favorite, one of my favorite t- childhood shows um, being involved in. But uh, <laughs> go go with the heat, ruining all of your television heroes <laughs> one episode at a time. <laughs> and that's you know, we're going to see a lot of great stuff from Evan in this episode. If we go back to where we were at the precinct, this scene ends with Switek recognizes Guzman as they're going through a book of mug shots. He turns out that Sonny might have a connection. Guzman was selling to a group called the Cazadores, and Sonny worked with a small arms dealer that was an, like a neo-Nazi dealer that was selling to the same Cazadores. So they'll run down that lead. Castillo says to go run it down. Sonny leaves. The conversation was very short and abrupt. And ca- you can see Castillo already s- recognizing, okay, something's not something's not right here. Well, after Castillo kind of looks to Sonny sideways, we, cu- we jump to the neo-Nazi dealer. He's selling out of like, it almost looks like the basement of his house, right? Or, or maybe not basement of the house, but some small business, something like that. There's a firing range. We get a cool little gun demo with Sonny shooting targets that pop up from behind walls which i don't know but crockett plays a pretty good trump supporter in this yeah he does he does actually he his angle with this dealer is that he's like uh so he's still working undercover this dealer doesn't know that he's a cop so they didn't bust him they were they must have been using him to try and bring down the casadoras and that his his angle is is that he wants to buy some mac 10s he wants to buy a bunch of them because he's like a survivalist he feels like there's subs off the coast that have targets on them and he needs to prepare for an invasion i would imagine that this this is a very believable interaction in Florida. Yeah, I'd say especially for Florida. Yeah. So, but it it is a it is a little strange that at a gun place to just ask the guy for uh, five Mac tens. He says a couple dozen. And the guy's like, hey, I don't deal in those kinds of quantities. Like, well, then who's your dealer? He just jumps. He just goes straight for it. That's cool. If you don't do it, who supplies you? Which is clearly the plan all along. That's what his goal was. Mm -hmm. So, Jenna, I figured you'd want to spend a minute acknowledging the hat wearing, sleeveless, you know, (laughs) kind of look that Sonny had going on in this scene. It's very conflicting for me because he's playing a neo-Nazi, but he looks so good. (laughs) Like, just so good so it's it's pro- it's problematic for me i mean like john said he, he plays it off really well it's, it's a big comeback from brenda and that, <laughs> that whole deal <laughs> i'm gonna say he's making a clear play at my heart and i'm i'm willing to let him in <laughs> when we leave from the nazi scene we from the neo-nazis and the that arm dealer we go we jump to guzman so they they were sonny was able to his connection worked they got straight to guzman him and tubbs are there talking to guzman about buying the mac 10s the conversation is going well and then in the middle of it evan starts walking down the stairs and as soon as he comes down from upstairs he immediately he starts yelling at Sonny, like, I don't trust this guy. Get this guy out of here. And Guzman has to walk him back. So one thing this scene kind of that I made notice about this scene was that Crockett and Tubbs are very firm negotiators. I've noticed every time they've gone undercover, they're always trying to undercut the price. You know, even now they're being told like price is what? 25 or $2,400. 2400 and, yeah. Yeah. And Crockett and Tubbs are like, no, it's 15 That's our final offer. Yeah. And then Evan's know? like, no deal. It's like, all right, fine. We'll leave. It's just funny that they always try and get the, like, that's always their angle. They're always trying to lowball them, you yeah. know, and like somehow that always works. 
And Evan comes down throwing serious shade on both of them. He even drops, he even calls Tubbs blood. Whoa. <laughs> serious. Yeah, he's he's like, uh, you got any problems with that blood? Can, can I point out something else, too? I noticed that the crocodile, you'd see that Crocodile Tubbs' his undercover name is Barnett. That's um, Sonny. He's Sonny Burnett. 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 That's a little Charlie uh, Barnett reference, you know? Now, instead of being Sonny Crockett, his undercover name is Sonny Burnett. Okay. No one will ever be able to figure that out. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> What's clear in this scene is that Evan and Sonny definitely recognize each other. We don't know why, but they definitely know each other. And as soon as they walk out the door, as soon as so they kind of... Guzman walks them back. It's like, no, look, like, I want to do business with you guys. You guys want to buy this. I'm sure we'll come to a reasonable offer. Sonny and Crockett, sorry, Sonny and Rico leave. And as they're as soon, as soon as they get out the front door, Tubbs is like, hey, what's the deal with that guy? And Crockett's like, he's a cop. Can I ask, is this the same house that was the in the Great McCarthy? It looks, it looks so, so similar. It <laughs> is. It is. It's the same house. It's also the same house in the movie Scarface. Oh. Um, and I want to say, I believe it's Guzman, or or as Dominic put it, Mafia Guy Number Seven. <laughs> yeah, um, Scarface. He's also he also has a connection. I want to say he was also in Scarface. So very very whole lot of Scarface references in, in this uh, particular episode. Guzman is played by Al Israel. So like as you're saying, like he's he was in a bunch of mob movies and a uh, fairly accomplished actor. He plays We're, Hector the Toad in Scarface. Mm. So after we find out now, we've confirmed that Evan is a cop, and those and Sonny and Evan definitely know each other. We go over to the precinct, and this is the big setup for how this episode is going to end. Castillo is having a meeting with ATF agent Wilson, and they're talking because Evan is working with the ATF and he is infiltrating Guzman's operation. He's been in there for months. They're spending a whole bunch of money. And obviously, Castillo, he wants to get the MAC-10s off the street. He doesn't want these kinds of guns on the streets of Miami. ATF agent's like, I'm not having any part of that. And Castillo just calmly tells the guy, you can get fucked. We're going to get those guns anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he basically tells them, like, I'll arrest anyone I want. Like, I'll arrest your man too. Like They eventually settle on that the Miami Vice team, he calls in Crockett and Tubbs. They're going to settle on that. They can get the guns, but they have to leave Evan alone. They're not done with that investigation in with Guzman. So leave him. Get your MAC-10s. Leave Evan alone. That's how we're going to proceed from here. Which Cro actually turns out, be, because of this, turns out to be one of the weirdest busts that I think I've ever seen on this show. Mm -hmm. We will get to that soon. Yeah. And then Crockett asks for a few minutes of Castillo's time. They talk privately, and Crockett wants off the case. He doesn't say why. He just wants off, and Castillo tells him, tough shit. We want, we, we need to br bring these down. So Crockett just storms out. Like, I don't like this place. I can't wait till I can move out. He storms past Tubbs. Tubbs asks him what's going on. It's like, nothing. He just leaves. So then Tubbs and Gina talk, and Tubbs asks Gina to do some looking into the guy's name, Evan Freed. And of course, that's Tubbs goes to one of the ladies because they're, the, they're actually good cops and know how to use a computer. After we leave the precinct we jump back to guzman's and we have a brief scene here where guzman is going to talk to evan they're going to talk about this deal but the, my favorite part of this is because we know that guzman he's been shot in the leg that's what it says in his police report but he's like sitting in the pool and he's like just puts his arms up like i need upsies and his bodyguard <laughs> comes over and lifts him out of the pool <laughs> His bodyguard, who's like the, he's like OJ, just yeah. walking around in like tight ass sweatpants all the time. <laughs> there is no mysteries with the bodyguard. We get, we see a lot of the bodyguard. A of lot his, uh, of the bodyguard. Of his physique in those tight sweatpants. Yes. <laughs> this conversation is really short. It's basically just a hammer home that Guzman and Evan talk. Evan saying he doesn't trust this quote unquote Burnett guy. And Guzman says like he didn't see, he didn't feel that. He's going to sell them five guns then if they want, and then he'll sell them the rest. And then if the deal goes wrong, he's just going to kill them. And Evan kind of signals, he kind of says to him like, well, no, I would, I'd probably kill him for you. But this is what drives us to the next scene where at Sonny's boat, which by the way, does just everyone in the world know where, where his boat is? I mean, how could they not? Yeah. It's, it's like, just... he's the worst undercover cop ever. <laughs> yeah. It's almost like you could just look into it in like Miami phone book, you know, and it says Sonny Crockett, 
also, uh, aka Sonny Barnett, <laughs> aka Sonny So and So, lives yeah. at one Marina Circle, number seven. <laughs> <laughs> Beware of alligator. <laughs> and like I said, this is what sets up this scene: is the scene with Guzman, where Guzman says, "If if this deal goes south, I'm just gonna kill him." So we go to the to the boat and. Evan just walks up to to the boat. He says hi to Elvis. Elvis doesn't respond, which I'm pretty sure the Miami Vice is like weekend at burning Elvis at this point. <laughs> He's not actually alive. They just he like died on around. episode three, and they just had him stuffed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. After that situation where he demolished all those other people's boats, and you know they had to put him down, but you know the show just didn't have the heart to tell everyone. Uh huh. Can, can, I, I just want to talk about a little side note here. Do you guys remember the very beginning when we watched the very first couple episodes? They kind of portrayed a Sonny Crockett as having a little bit of a, a an issue with drinking. You know, we saw mm-hmm. him drink quite a bit. I, oh, yeah. I, I've noticed progressively through the show, he is drinking less and less. And then in this episode, we get Evan, who's kind of a heavy drinker throughout this episode. And, mm-hmm. you know portrayed drinking pretty heavily Mm -hmm. uh, while doing the reckless stuff that he's doing i just think it's it's kind of weird that you know the it's shifted away i I guess they they only have there's only room for one drunk cop per episode (laughs) true true i think it makes it come back later in the show's run but things things are actually kind of going okay for sunny lately so maybe that might have something to do with it too like the greatest going pretty good i mean his kid moved miles away he just (laughs) woke up with his girlfriend um, I mean, they're only on a break. For the okay? old, uh... They're on a break. They're not broken up. The whole reason why Evan came to the boat is, and he says it right in the very beginning, which is, this is a deal that you don't. That sorry, Guzman wants this deal in the worst way, trying to signal to him this guy that that you're dealing with is no joke. He's like, I'd rather work with your partner with Tubbs rather than you. And Sonny just flies off the handle, like, no way, you're dealing with me. I'm working this case. I'm not getting off it. And he tells Evan, like, we're not buddies. You don't owe me nothing. I remember when you said those bad things about me 10 years ago. You know, whatever his issue is with Evan, which we'll find out later what the actual issues are. You're page one in my burn book, essentially. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And then Evan goes on a long, weird rant. He pulls a gun on Sonny and he goes on to this long, weird rant. And we just basically put together that Evan, yeah, he's, he's a cop, but he's in way too deep. Which seems to be pretty thematic for the guys that Sonny knows like when those guys resurface it's all cops that have gone in way too deep we've had a number of those episodes now and we know that that's a trigger for sunny Mm -hmm. because he's worried about how little of his own identity is left outside of like who he is when he's undercover yeah it's at this point start getting the feeling that evan got someone killed or something this is this is when i started really getting suspicious that uh somehow crockett and evan were partners and evan must have gotten another cop killed or something for being you know because yeah like you said it just seems to always be that theme that there's that you know it's that that reckless cop that that crocodile always gets has this type of attitude towards exactly and that's what leads us right into this next scene we have a brief stop at the precinct it's just gina and tubbs and gina's telling tubbs that she found out some some information not very much but some information about evan so that he and sunny worked together and with another man named mike orgel and orgel was killed evan worked on the vice team they worked with Orgel. After Orgel got killed, Evan started signing up for basically every suicide mission that there was out there. So he left the vice team and just, you name it, he'll he's willing to do it. Which brings us to a great scene uh, with when Tubbs confronts Sonny about this ab- about this information. It's later that night. It's in out- their confessional. In the yep. in the mm-hmm. what is that Lamborghini Ferrari or something? It's in the Ferrari and Tubbs. Uh, see, this is why we we've talked about this before. Is that we just like Tubbs' style? He just straight up comes out and it's like, "Hey, so what's up with this Mike guy?" Yep, uh, just straight to the point. Yeah, and actually, to be honest with you, in the beginning, you know, Crockett tries to tell Tubbs to stay out of bi- out of his business, but you kind of get the feeling like Crockett's kind of being a little bit of a kind of a dickhead, you know? Oh you yeah, know? I mean, Especially not even being a that little they're bit. partners. Yeah, and that's yeah. That really is what comes down in this conversation, right? Because Crockett slams on the brakes. He flips out on Tubbs for looking into him when he said to leave it alone. And Tubbs is like, hey, man, 
are we friends or do you want to just be partners? Like, that's fine if you want to drop that's... the whole, like, we're friends, but you just need to be upfront with me about that. Yeah, and let's not forget, last week, Crockett let Tubbs get his ass whipped by dropping the ball. So you think Tubbs would be, like, kissing up, I mean, Crockett would be kissing up to Tubbs trying yeah. to make up for that. It was just last week, and now Sonny's acting like he's a victim again. Right. right. Yeah, exactly. And the, the conversation basically is like, we're not friends anymore. We're just partners. And it reminded me a lot of like Seinfeld with Elaine and Putty. We're like, me and you, we're broken up for the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> That's so perfect. So, okay. So, especially with how short it is before Rocky comes back and is like, hey, we need to talk. <laughs> Uh, uh, I'm ready to make up now. Just need Tubbs to stop him. Like, no, look, he points to his jacket. Eight ball. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. So, so they so drop we it, get a quick scene where Evan vouches for Crockett and Tubbs, and then we we get the Tubbs speaking French or pretending to speak French. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, there's so. that deal. We we have a brief stopover where there's like a preliminary deal where Guzman tries to raise the price up to 3000 Of course, the deal is like, no, we're out. Like, that's not the price that, that she told us was going to be. And Guzman's just like, he's just going to deal with it. That's what the price is. He starts to walk away and Evan grabs Guzman and says, hey, I, I gave him a price of 2400 What are you doing? And Guzman pulls a gun on Evan and Evan goes like reservoir dogs in go ahead, shoot me. I'm one of you. Yeah, good luck selling any guns in this area, essentially. Like without me. Mm-hmm. You you're you're gonna be mm-hmm. nothing without me. And just like totally puts him on the spot and Guzman just shrivels back like the weak person that he is and And he walks away and Evan turns and looks over his shoulder at Sonny and winks at him. Of course Tubbs is like Oh yeah, there's nothing shady going on here. Yeah, this is cool. Yeah. I'm glad no one's giving me any information. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Even so, though I'm the one competent so, okay. here. Let's jump to Tubbs speaking French to uh, Michelle. Let's see where we have it. The... Michelle. Yeah, and so this Tubbs, is when... Tubbs is out having a good time. He's relaxing, doing his thing. He's picking he, up on the ladies. Yeah, he, he's throwing his game out there. And this is the time when Sonny, one again, I have to call him a dickhead, decides that now he wants to talk about his feelings. Oh, mm-hmm. he's so, so selfish. And he, he's being such he comes a comes over. Block. Yeah, and just cock blocks Tubbs. Who's got the whole French thing going down? He's um, convinced and her to come back him. to his place. She's like, she's down. She told her ride that she's that she's going to his place. She's all in. He's got. The, he, he made the deal. Which, yeah. as we and all then know, Crockett just guilts him into giving all that up just so he could go talk about uh, his feelings uh, at the gas station. His feelings. Yeah. Uh huh. But we. I mean, we all. Let's face it. Okay. We were all worried for Michelle there for a few minutes, and she more or less dodged the carpet <laughs> okay now she just gets to leave feeling nice because someone had picked her up without actually having to go through getting her face swallowed and three and a half hours of really awkwardly slow foreplay <laughs> let's make one thing straight though what must uh, be the hottest him and foxy brown were never exclusive so rochelle's open game you know if he can get her into that sweaty man carpet then that's all him but what i'm saying is that she doesn't know you don't know what you don't know john okay and we should all just be real happy for michelle that she didn't find out because that he wants to have sex at some sort of greenhouse okay <laughs> i am just impressed at the at the stuff that Tubbs knows how to do, man. I mean, speaking French, he is uh, the, the other week you were playing the saxophone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's the most interesting man in the world. I swear. Tubbs says, sorry, Michelle. I'm going to, I have to go take care of my friend. I'll take a rain check on it. He runs off. And now we go to the gas station. And although... It may not be the scene that Tubbs was trying to get to. This ends up being a really important scene, and we get to really see Crockett and Tubbs' friendship come through in this scene. What happens here is that Crockett is taking Tubbs to where Mike Orgel got killed. He, they get out of the car. They walk out to the end of the gas station. He says, right here, this is where Mike was standing. And then over here is where the guy with the shotgun who was high on angel dust shot him. He didn't call for backup. Mike just went over there and, and tried to stop this guy. And Tubbs like, well, he's a real hero. And Crockett's like, no, it was suicide. And then he goes into the story of that Mike. They were doing Evan, some investigation that brought them to a, a series of gay clubs. 
Yeah, so Mike, Evan, and Sonny all went to the academy together. They're all great friends. They all got turned out at the same time. And they and then you're right. Early when they were when they were early on the Vice team, they started working a case that involved them in doing investigations at gay bars. And Mike requested not to be part of that investigation. And jokingly, which sounds really familiar for men even nowadays that Sonny says like oh well then there was some jokes like well maybe someone would recognize you and they were kind of laughing it off because they were all close friends and Mike drops the bomb it's like yes someone might recognize me if I do investigations at these gay bars that Mike was gay yep uh, this is amazing just to point out for our era this is 1985 a show openly discussing yeah. a gay police not just a gay person but a gay police officer part of that the fraternal order of police officers like the ultimate man's club right and Sonny goes into a long talk about how he feels terrible for mike dying because when mike came out everyone turned against him and Sonny didn't say or do anything he didn't say it was against he just didn't protect mike and that's why he carries this guilt is that he didn't protect his friend yeah 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 so- and to, to expand on that too i mean it wasn't just like everyone in the department Mike's closest friends, Evan, something recalls Evan discriminating against Mike, calling him discriminatory terms, you know, multiple yeah, he, he times. Yeah, he out on him. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, you know, essentially Crockett's admitting to, to the fact that him and Evan really turned their back on Mike. And you can see the guilt both of them hold all the way throughout to the end of the episode, how guilty they feel, both Crockett and even Evan, for the way they treated him. Crockett holds this anger against Evan because he feels like he didn't defend Mike against Evan being really flipping out on him. Right. And so we should note, though, that this is one of the earlier moments in TV, especially where someone's talking and they're addressing not only any kind of homosexual undertone or storyline, but doing so with I should have been better, like I should have been mm-hmm. more supportive and like been there for them. Like it wasn't just falling into like the same kind of tropes of having the overly eccentric gay man on the show right like you see Mm -hmm. a a couple shows like different strokes had a few episodes hill street blues had a couple episodes where they bring up gay characters even a show hotel brought up a couple gay characters hotel by far maybe leaning in the way of like (laughs) giving them actual non-tropey stories to fall into but this miami vice episode with evan premiered right after the golden girls premiered which uh, i mean of course everyone should know is just by far and away one of the best shows in the 80s uh, for having (laughs) real not I mean it's a great show anyway but like for having a lot of gay storylines and Mm -hmm. gay characters um, and treating them like like normal people like it's not super yeah the normal people that they are and yeah I mean the 80s it struggled all the way through the 80s to address even in the 90s and we still deal with it today but things are definitely getting better you know it but this is Mm -hmm. this this episode is such a big deal because it's so early in not just addressing that there's gay people but then having a main character on the show his regret is is that he didn't support him yeah i mean i think that that's super meaningful that it's not just waving it off well you know i think he had a problem and, and mm-hmm. i just didn't want to be a part of it it's like yeah, recognizing think, that that's a problem that he should have I, I been will supportive. say this though as strong as, as the theme is and everything with this episode i think the one thing they were missing with episode was a strong homosexual character to follow up the storyline with we never actually meet mike the character he's always just referenced uh in, in the story i, I feel yeah. like that was the one thing we didn't that we don't get that would have yeah made that, this, uh, that may have been interesting like if they did if they did some flashbacks right so there is mm-hmm. another episode in a later season there is a gay character i think it, it's called god's work and mm-hmm. it, it, he's a like a drug kingpin's son Mm, mm -hmm. that is due to take over the business but uh, but i agree like it would have been i think a little bit more it would would have packed a little bit more if we had actually had a gay character i I, I just think it would have pushed it over the top even still it's a pretty powerful scene and by the end of it tubs kind of walks sunny back and they make up and now they're friends again too so sunny's able to get it off his chest tubs sticks by him and then kind of walks him back it's like hey you know everything's good i'm here let's 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 take care of this 
and uh, they're back to being buddies again. After we have this great recon- reconciliation scene between Tubbs and Crockett, we get the next morning, we go back to the precinct, and everyone's working inside. You know, it's a normal day at the office. And <laughs> what was funny to me, a little uh, lead into this and not being so serious, because this is going to be another scene that's really serious. Right off the bat, I we see Zito get up, and he's going to go fill up his coffee, and his mug clearly says, number one cop. And then we p- it pans <laughs> over as he walks by and Tubbs is holding a cup a mug that says number one cop so which one is it <laughs> does the whole department have number one cop mugs <laughs> is it just like standard issue that they all have number one cop it, it, it was a, it was a gift from Castillo to make everyone feel special <laughs> <laughs> it's like a Los Feliz daycare style where it's like we want everyone to feel good so everyone gets a number one cop mug so there's it's a normal day in the office Evan comes stumbling in into the office drunk super drunk and he so he stumbles over to the desk and he says he's trying to talk to crockett just crockett and so he tells Tubbs to like you know go go somewhere to step it crockett immediately says like don't go anywhere he doesn't have to go anywhere what do you want to talk mm-hmm. about yeah, starts they... you know seeming like he's gonna go off a little bit more and they go what do they think he takes them back into like one of the interrogate or like the meeting room or something mm-hmm. definitely the big meeting room and he he immediately evan's like i'm all a man i'm all out. man but i have a brain so he starts to say he, he leads in like yes i harassed mike because i'm all man i'm basically like i'm not gay but he's carrying so much regret this for the same reason that Sonny is. He regrets not being there for Mike and letting that happen to him. He rants a little bit, then he immediately breaks down, starts crying, and hugs Crockett. And what was noticeable in this scene, too, is that he starts it off by saying, I, I, you know, I'm such a man. And then he breaks down almost in the tears and falls kind of into Sonny's arms where you see all of this guilt he has. And then as soon as Tubbs sticks his head into the, the room, he immediately pushes Sonny away and is back to being a big, strong man, you know? He goes right back into character. So yeah, He goes right back into character and he confesses to Sonny. He's like, I'm basically, I'm carrying the same regret that you are for what happened to Mike. I I've made a bad choice and basically telling Sonny, like, stop holding it over me. Please forgive me for this. That's what that's ultimately what Evan wants. And then after he jumps back into character and when Tubbs comes in, he leaves the precinct and you see everyone in the precinct just watching him as he leaves. And you see that the blinds were open inside of that meeting room. Everyone in the office was kind of like, we're not watching, but we're watching. We were totally sorry. We totally watched that entire thing. (laughs) (laughs) This is the 80s. The walls are paper thin. We heard heard everything. And we're talking about a bunch of the number one cops. They're very observant. Yes. (laughs) They they have the coffee mugs to prove it. (laughs) (laughs) Jeez, this whole scene just gutted me. Like, I mean, and and I thought it made me really frustrated with Sonny because I just wanted Sonny to understand some, like, someone else's guilt and, like, try harder to get past his own frustration around it like he builds up so many barriers to people around it that when he's begging Sonny to forgive him just someone please tell him that he can be forgiven and Sonny's just not even really holding him <laughs> or I'm just mm-hmm. like oh my god like, will you just hold him yeah, like, I you, were just, feel like... you were just I... doing the exact same thing with your friend and you won't do this to the other guy like what the hell yeah I, I, I felt it was kind of weird that throughout the entire scene like Sonny was still clearly angry at him like he hadn't forgiven him yeah even up until the final scene and that's where we're gonna go right now we're gonna this is the final scene we're gonna go to yes. the deal the duo is gonna go make their last arms deal with guzman they take the speedboat out to like a naval junkyard or not even naval it's just like boats not as in naval military but naval as in just regular boats they go way out it's way far away but it's definitely coordinated because castillo was there with his sailor's hat and his corn cob pipe up in the <laughs> lookout of one of the big tugboats yes <laughs> Dude, uh, it, like, how long did it take him to get up there, too? <laughs> He's just watching out for the uh, storm of the century. Nothing uh-huh. about this meeting makes sense to me. Like, they're waiting there. Oh, the this heli- makes total sense. I was like, this is this this was an amazing scene. What? Yes. The yes. helicopter so, comes in when they're like, oh, I think, he's, like, I think he's standing up. And then the helicopter comes in. It's like, how is nobody wondering about what's happening with this? <laughs> it's just some random helicopter. Oh. Like, this is clearly like a pre-9-11 America because that <laughs> helicopter so, has just... 
and the, and the boxes in the helicopter that are just clearly labeled yeah. small arms. <laughs> like, yeah. So one thing I want to point out, Tubbs hides the money by this old boat, uh, you know, a few hundred feet away from where they finally end up. I, I just want to point that out as we get further into the scene. That becomes important. Number two. Helicopters must have been cheap in the 80s because everybody had one. Like every bad guy, that's the first thing they have is they have a helicopter. It's like step one. Well, sorry, almost every bad guy, step one, buy a helicopter. Step one yes. for bad guy in made for each other is buy a dump truck. <laughs> yes, yes. He was so, working his way up to a helicopter. So let's let's set the scene here. Tubbs and Crockett go there alone. Castillo and the vice, the other vice team are hidden around. They are in two police cars and Castillo's watching from his bird's Castillo's nest. Castillo's playing captain. He, he's, got, <laughs> yeah. he's up there tooting the horn. <laughs> <laughs> Guzman and Evan with the bodyguard come up and I was surprised. There's like, there's no bodyguards. There's nothing. All right. They just, they just show up. They're going to do this deal. Tubbs makes a remark. You're traveling light. There's no way you got guns in there. He's like, no, there's no way you got cash. Cause like you mentioned, John, the cash has been, he, he hit it underneath the boat. Oh, you so, know what? And, and, Actually, we should Hold mention on. here that before they really get into the nitty gritty with all of this, Tubbs says to Crockett, he's like, you know, this, you really should talk to Evan. This could be the time that you get to talk to him and give yourself that chance to have the forgiveness and move on. He sort of sets the stage on that before before they get face to face with Evan and Guzman again. So we're at the stage. They're both like, you don't have the money. You don't have the weapons. So then we get helicopter lands with the guns and then Tubbs, I dream of genie. The money out of thin air. <laughs> Suddenly, he wiggles his nose, and the money appears, and the whole deal's going down. So, so here's here's the exciting part for me. This was this was the best part when it hit me. It hit me with well, like a ton of bricks. So then, Castillo says, "Okay, the exchange has been made. The vice team throws on the lights for the police cars. They come driving up, and they the like they're going to arrest everyone. It's the B team and the ladies, and then a couple other officers that are with them. They hold." everyone at gunpoint so evan guzman his bodyguard crockett and tubs hold them all at gunpoint and they start making comments like, oh i don't know if we have enough room to keep all these guns and take prisoners and so they load up all the guns they take the money and then leave they're stealing it so the vice's plan was to steal the guns and the money and just leave the reason why they have to do this is because of the conversation with the atf earlier they have to leave evan and guzman alone they can't make an arrest the only thing they can do is get the guns off the street and that's exactly what they did they staged a fake hold up they got the guns they got their money back and now the mac 10s won't be making it to the street because of the atf sunny and rico are their hands are tied they can't make a move on guzman for selling these arms because they have a deal with the atf to not arrest guzman all they could do was pull the guns off the street they signed so, a death sentence for evan yeah two my two biggest problems with this whole bust is one He's only selling a small portion of the weapons he has access to. And two, how is this supposed to work for Evan? Wouldn't mm -hmm. the assumption that, wouldn't Usman have the assumption that someone must be a mole when the cops show up? So by them just robbing him and letting Evan go back to try and be in his organization, wouldn't that just be the most suspicious thing in the world? Especially after Evan went out of his way to vouch for Crockett and Tubbs. Exactly. Exactly. Which is why it's out of the vice team's hand. It's because of the ATF. The ATF said Evan has to stand up because they're going to try and bring down Guzman later. But it makes it look like because Evan is the local guy that he set up this sting. So Guzman walks back to the car. He's going to get a gun. Now, I don't think he was going to shoot Evan. I think he was going to try and shoot. Crockett. Sunny and Tubbs, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But what I don't understand mm -hmm. is that Crockett and Tubbs, they start to walk away, which they have to be good enough cops at this point to understand the position that Evan's been put in. Why they're just trying to walk away and leave the situation as is. I don't understand where they think that that's going to be something feasible. But they have to. They have to because their deal is is that after this is done, after they get the MAC-10s off the street, they make sure that they don't make it to the streets of Miami, they're done. They are not allowed to be to do any more investigation. They have to leave Evan and Guzman alone. They have to keep their undercover, not to let them know that they're cops. Mm. So, so Guzman makes it back to the car and grabs mm -hmm. the gun. And Evan just kind of starts running toward Guzman. Uh, I guess, like Dominic was saying, I guess to protect Sonny and Rico from being shot. 
But I think we can. What, we all know that I it's, think, it's a little something more at this point, right? That he's been waiting for that bullet for a while. Mm-hmm. It looks more as if he's just trying to get himself shot. It's a suicide mission. He throws himself in front of those bullets to protect Sonny, but also just to end. It was the same thing that Mike did on why Mike died. Crockett quickly shoots Guzman, and it ends with Crockett holding Evan in his arms as Evan dies. And Evan Scene. tells Crockett, and now it's his turn to take a bullet. Yeah. He says that to him before he dies. He says, Which, actually, Mike's I decision. guess that... It was my decision, Th- and now it's your turn. So I guess that comes up later in the series in another episode in which a they bring up the for reference about a, yeah, a bullet for Crockett, which is brings up the reference him asking Crockett, telling Crockett that there's a bullet out there with his name on it. Yep. So really powerful. In the last few weeks, Vice has had a great lead up, and then it kind of fumbles the ending. Where this episode did the opposite. We had a slow build, slow build, slow build, and then just nails the ending. This is a great episode. I'm sure we're going to have a lot of thoughts on our closing section. Let's get over to the music from this episode, because we have some fantastic Peter Gabriel to talk about. All right, John, bring it home on the music here. We have uh, we have three great songs. Yes. So I want to start with the song You Only Left Your Picture by Fashion. And I'm going to start there because the other two songs are Peter Gabriel, and we are going to go get into the amazingness of the rock flute <laughs> in, in a second. So Fashion was a new wave punk band formed in 1978. They toured with The Police. They toured with U2. At the beginning of Duran Duran, they actually Duran Duran actually opened for them and briefly Pink Floyd's keyboardist Richard Wright was also in the band for a moment so but they really didn't have the same commercial success as the police or U2 so by the end of the 80s they kind of just fizzled out so now let's get to the great Peter Gabriel Peter Gabriel's the rhythm of the the heat off of his 1982 album which is actually a self-titled album Peter Gabriel but is known or nicknamed security so, and then we also have the song Biko, which is on a different self-titled album. I will get to that in a second. His 1980 album, which is nicknamed Melt. Peter Gabriel is most famous for being the original lead singer of Genesis and the band's rock flutist, because that was a thing. <laughs> <laughs> So the uh, rock flautist. Uh, yes. What an yes. odd band, so. right? Yeah, Phil Collins on drums, and then you have a rock flautist. Like, what else is, th- yeah. is there? Like, what other surprises are waiting in Genesis? So the band was formed in 1967, which, by the way, last week we had Mike Rutherford's side project band, Red Seven. Michael Mann must have just loved Genesis. Oh, oh, yeah. um, it, oh my god Peter Gabriel left the band in 1975 so little things you might not know is that early in the in the band Genesis Peter Gabriel used a dressing costume at shows he, he says that he did this to pick make up for poor audio quality during concerts it when they first started but it definitely became a theme to the point that in 1975 if you read between the lines on why they broke up, it was because the band didn't want to be associated with the guy that was dressing up in <laughs> costumes. I mean, they don't come out and say it, but basically that's the theme you get is like, I, they were really worried about the him being the... theatrical nature of their performances. <laughs> yes. Yes. Thank you. So, Peter Gabriel's first four solo records were all entitled P- Peter Gabriel. <laughs> And so fans, <laughs> are you listening? Are you listening so, to Peter Gabriel? I'm listening to Peter Gabriel. Peter Gabriel. Peter Gabriel. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Which is why both songs came from different albums, but both came from albums entitled Peter Peter Gabriel. <laughs> fans would, fans gave them nicknames, often calling the first one car, the second one scratch, the third one melt, and the fourth one security. That's and then weird. The next. <laughs> Yes. Oh, it is weirder. The next three albums he'd release were all two lettered names, So, Us, and Up. Are we talking yeah. like Peter so, Gabriel, a little like, weird. I'm, like I'm fixing clothes, I'm sewing, S-E-W, or S-O? S-O. Oh, that okay. Yeah, that's weird. Yeah. I mean, I guess so. it would be weird either way, but at least in the other <laughs> in the other way, it like semi makes a sentence. So, us up. So, Peter Gabriel's song, Biko, is actually a tribute to an anti-apartheid activist, Steve Biko, who died in 1977 at the hands of the South African police and brought a lot of attention to the movement because Peter Gabriel's actually been 
pretty political throughout his his career. So I want to end, but not to get too much into Peter Gabriel's solo career, which is just as weird as naming the, the your first four solo albums after yourself. <laughs> I, I, I want to get into other notable rock flutists because I feel like... <laughs> I feel like I should give I should give out you know they, 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 these guys should be recognized for their contribution to rock and roll and uh, and the rock flute. So I have just a quick top ten of <laughs> of uh, and actually it's a it's a top nine with a dishonorable mention which I will get to last. <laughs> um, <laughs> What? So I want to start with Ian Anderson, who is the king of the rock flute, and that is Jethro Tull's flutist, mm, Ian okay. Anderson. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, the hard um, rocking Jethro Tull. <laughs> so I would always I would put Peter Gabriel, you know, somewhere in like two or three. We're gonna roll with him at two, and I'm gonna put Ray the Flute Thomas <laughs> at number three. Um, <laughs> He, he's the flutist <laughs> for the band The Moody Blues. Then we have, I feel, Hart and Wilson. Just incredible flutist. I, I feel <laughs> it. Number four should be Ann Wilson from Hart. You so, know what's amazing so uh, far? So we've gotten to this point. I didn't know any of these bands had flutists. Yeah, not at all. <laughs> See, that's why this segment is important because now I am putting I'm I'm putting you on notice. The flute is important in rock music. You're, you're doing so, necessary num- work, John. At number five, I have Mel Collins from the bands Camel, King Crimson, and the mm. Alan Parsons Project. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I would then go six with Chris Wood. Uh, from the band Traffic. Seven would be Jerry Eubanks from the Marshall Tucker Band. <laughs> I feel eight being Andrew Latimer, who was also in the band Camel and had a few other sidetracks. Wait, Two? how many Nine, and people, did this is, have? This is... <laughs> did they, wait, they did had they, two, they, and actually, like, believe it or you, not, you King know when, Crimson when, also had two. What? <laughs> like, you know when, when you've got two, two guitarists and they did go not like, play back to back and they play? In any band. What? Mel Collins did not play flute alone in any band. He, had, he was joined. He had, there, there was a second flutist in King Crimson. <laughs> <laughs> and a featured flutist in the Alan Parsons Project. So, And then this is the most controversial, but I, I feel number nine is Burt Cummings of the Guess Who. And I feel mm. it's just because he, did, he didn't break it out enough. So, But I feel like that's going to be the most controversial. So <laughs> uh, last but not least, the dishonorable mention goes to the Ukraine's band Nocturnal Mortem, who Who's flute player Sagittarius? So, and the reason they get a dishonorable mention is that they are a Nazi black metal band. Mm, so, so they have a flautist, but we're not going to uh, support their type of music. Yes, I was just very impressed that a Nazi black metal band would have a flutist, a uh, flautist. <laughs> um, it, it it seems very strange to me, but it's that, the Ukraine. That just all got so very complicated. Know, maybe. Yes. So I figured I'd throw them in there just at the end. Uh, okay, so John, I've got something to add to your... I mean, I'm never going to be able to top the the list of flutists. <laughs> top ten. But pertaining to, <laughs> pertaining to our boy Peter Gabriel and Miami Vice. So we already touched that clearly they, there was like a strong, strong love for Genesis, right? And Genesis members or their songs in general have shown up on the, have shown up a bunch of times. I did want to mention that with seven songs, seven of his songs used, he's the most featured solo artist for Miami Vice. Mm. He has epi- uh, songs featured in every season except for season two, and five out of the nine tracks on the album So were used throughout the series. So they used almost an entire album. Yeah, big wow. fans. They're wow. all about the flute. <laughs> <laughs> that was... That came out of nowhere, John. I was not prepared <laughs> that there was ten rock flautists out there and let alone and not only as you found them but you ranked them <laughs> uh, i'm telling you people need to look into ray the aka the flute thomas um, <laughs> who, who was with the who who was the fl- flautist for the the moody blues band that guy is just incredible <laughs> let's that's just music even blows me away every week let's get over to our final thoughts on this episode <laughs> 
All right, Jenna, why don't you kick us off this week with your final thoughts on this episode, season one, episode 22, titled Evan. Okay, I know that I've been a wet blanket for a number of episodes now. <laughs> that I, This show is just, I mean, it's been a very interesting exploration for me, and I would by no means say that I am a fan. But I'm hanging in there, and there are moments, namely when Sonny is wearing his sleeveless shirts without a jacket. Um, <laughs> I enjoy those moments, so I'm just going to hang on, right? But this this episode was really good. Like, really good. I thought that William Russ did an amazing job playing Evan, and I really liked the the moments with him. Like, the fact that they were dealing with a very difficult issue, and I thought the writing was really good as well. Like, when Evan comes in and he's doing that sort of confession in the precinct, and he's talking with with Sonny and he talks about you know you essentially you just you think every day and you hope to achieve wisdom at some point right and like I'm not perfect and I know that you're perfect and to just see that that moment happen and Sonny to be faced with it and he clearly doesn't understand he doesn't see himself as perfect at all or why anyone would see him that way it makes me really hopeful for the future of getting more episodes like this and i've heard amazing things about the episode that we're about to watch for lombard so i'm i'm looking forward to it i'm feeling i'm feeling amped for the end of the season and i agree this this episode was great great writing great acting it was good all the way through and this is we we've had these ups and downs in the season i wanted to take my opportunity here my final thoughts for this episode is a point out to remind people that this is the first time we've ever watched miami vice but the pilot episode was the first time any of us had ever seen an episode and so i know there's a lot of miami vice fans out there because i've heard some stuff that happens in later seasons that we might change our opinions on characters that maybe we're a little hard on now, but we will come around to in later seasons. Just reminded that we haven't seen an episode ever. Every week, these episodes are brand new to us. And I hope that you're enjoying this ride that we're going on. Because for, like, when I talk to my wife, who's a mega Miami Vice fan, she she is uh, frustrated sometimes because we talk about a character that maybe we're not, you know, the biggest fans of. But it's because she has future knowledge of what's going to happen to these characters and how it morphs your opinion about them in the future i hope you're enjoying this ride that we're going through as we watch these for the first time and our opinions about characters start to change as we go forward and an example of that would be tubs tubs in the beginning of the show run in the beginning of the season we he was there but we weren't big tubs fans but i think now especially after the last couple weeks where tubs just goes straight for the heart on the characters especially against sunny and as a that brings that perfect balance to the to the crime fighting duo that they are to keep sunny in check when he needs to be and just like sunny is there always leading with his heart and making sure that they do that they always try their hardest even for someone who may not be the best character but tubs is a good friend to sunny and he has nailed it in the last two weeks so he's been my favorite part for the last couple weeks and i really enjoyed this episode i'm really looking forward to lombard oh i completely agree on tubs by the way yeah. coming around to be like a fantastic character <laughs> john what are your final thoughts on this episode so my final thoughts are that this is such a very powerful episode but I, I, it's also in my terms like it should be like the go-to episode if you want to know why i Vice feist was icon was a big iconic tv show this is the episode you need to watch as because of just the message and just how well done the episode was for what was going on in, during the 80s and everything. And I think what jumps out to me, too, is that, like you, you had talked about, Dominic, earlier, this is the same director who directed the uh, previous episode, Made for Us. Made for each other? Yeah, which was very sitcom-y. It had all of the goofy stuff between the, the B team. This episode was just such a stark different episode from that. It was so weird to think that they were both the same director you can see where he would you know why he was important to vice and that's to be honest, Made for Each Other is when we kind of turned the corner on the B team to where we came around and started to understand their relationship better and stop being so hard on those guys true that's gonna do it for us this week we hope you enjoyed the episode we have one episode left in season one so we are all super excited for the way this season ends and we have a bunch of great shows lined up for doing a recap and following up on some of our favorites from season one we would love to hear from you email us go with the heat at gmail.com get us on twitter or facebook we would love to hear what's your favorite episode or your favorite guest stars from season one hashtag those go gwth go with the heat so gwth 
hashtag goes GWTH. We would love to hear from you, hear what your favorite episodes are, who your favorite guest stars are. Email us, get us on Twitter, go to our website, click, click on subscribe, find all the ways you can subscribe to the show, including YouTube and Stitcher, not just normal RSS. We hope you enjoy this episode and we'll see you all next week. Bye, pals. Food is metal. Ha, 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 ha.